so yeah, we'll get started. So welcome to the Sports and Entertainment Tableau user group. Um, just to give a little background of who we are today. Um, so Mikkel couldn't be here today. Um, she'll continue to be our main leader. Um, Catherine Rowe is me. Um, I work at Tableau slash Salesforce. Um, and then we have Fiona McKenna from the Seattle Kraken. Super excited to have her here today. Um, and she'll be giving us a presentation. So why are we here? Um, we do this every six to eight weeks to share best practices in the industry. Um, we have demos from industry leaders, Tableau tips and, tips and tricks, Q&A and panel sessions, and we're always open to suggestions. So you'll see emails at the end, feel free to send us emails, add us on LinkedIn. Um, and please, if you're interested in, in presenting or being a part of this or have any tips, feel free to reach out to us. Um, the biggest thing for, I think, the sports industry and entertainment industry in general is bringing people together. So obviously it's difficult to get together. Um, that really doesn't stop us. We, we try our best to stay connected. Um, we have a LinkedIn group where I spend a lot of time posting roles that are open for any students that are interested in getting into sports, especially in Tableau. Um, and then really just add another avenue for networking. So as we go through the presentation today, if you see people in the chat that work at specific areas that you're interested in, feel free to reach out to them. That's the whole point of this. It's really the whole point of the Tableau community is to continue kind of growing together um, as, a, as a place where people can, can learn and, and get better at, at, at our tool. On deck, um, we'll do welcome and introductions, which I'm doing now. Um, a little bit of a look ahead to what we will have coming up next. Um, we'll have Fiona kind of talk about, I uh, gave it this title <laughs> from Finance to Sports, Building a Tableau Culture at the Kraken. Um, closing in questions, we'll have about 10 to 15 minutes um, to, to answer any questions you guys have. Um, as we kind of go through, you can feel free to add those to the chat and I'll kind of keep track of them throughout. Um, past presenters, we've had Databricks come in and talk about some of the work they've done with the MLB. Um, Duncan and Ali, who are two of our really great solutions engineers at Tableau, have given tutorials for anyone new to the tool and want to learn. Um, we also have Chris from the Carolina Hurricanes, who's usually a steady attendee, but I think he, he said he had uh, a few meetings today, so he might not make it. Um, but Chris is always, uh, Chris Paolini is always open to helping people out with Tableau. Um, he joined the Hurricanes last year and has been a really great part of this community as we've kind of kicked it off in the last couple, couple months. Um, <clears throat> like I said, we'll have kind of product focused sessions, presentations, Q&A. Um, wanted to highlight Tableau Conference May 17th through 19th. Um, I'll have a little bit of a plug there with the link. Um, the next tug is going to be late June, July, um, and you'll understand why, because it's going to be with the Golden State Warriors. Um, we'll have Kim, who does partnership insights and analytics, power user of Tableau, and really has built up kind of their platform there at the Warriors. So super excited to have her, but obviously they're in the playoffs right now. Um, who knows how far they'll go, but um, we'll have them after that, after the, the playoffs end. And then, like I said, uh, Tableau Conference, May 17th to 19th. I'll be there in person in Vegas. So if you're going to be there, please reach out. We'd love to connect with anyone in sports. Um, and there's also a virtual component, which is really cool and an opportunity to also connect. Um, there's a virtual session with the Te Texas Rangers talking about how they use both Tableau and Slack to, to connect um, their data to their coaching staff. So really cool use cases there. And I will pop in the registration link. Um, and the, the, um, the virtual uh, Tableau conference is free. So anyone can join and attend um, for that one. So I am gonna pop in a multitasking here, but um, feel free to register there. And cool, um, feel free, like I said, post questions for the speakers in the Q&A box. Um, I'll try to answer questions as we go, kind of collect them. Um, also get to know your fellow attendees today. Um, good amount of people here today. So super excited for everyone to meet each other. Um, cool, so we'll, I'm gonna stop sharing and we'll kind of kick it off with Fiona first in like a little bit of a Q&A panel. So you'll be hearing more of me, but more of her probably than me. And then we'll go into some of the examples that she shared over with us. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing and you should just see us now. Um, so Fiona, if you wanna just give a brief introduction to yourself, your background, 
and then we'll go from there and kind of hit on some of the questions that we've discussed. Sure, sounds good. Um, hi, everyone. Um, thanks to Tableau and to Catherine. I'm so excited to be here. Um, what an awesome community and product in general. So this is exciting. Um, so I'm Fiona. Um, I grew up outside Chicago, Illinois, and I played hockey for, for forever. Um, I went to Princeton University and played ice hockey there. And then I played a year of pro hockey after, actually. Um, and then I also entered the real adult world, um, had a little bit of shoots and ladders career-wise um, in finance, and then landed at the Kraken about a year ago. So I moved to Seattle a year ago um, for the first season with the Kraken, um, and I'm a business intelligence analyst. So I'm the BI team. There's about seven of us at the Kraken. And um, that's the brief little Cliff Notes version of, of, of who I am. Cool. Um, so let's kind of talk about that. So I played college sports um, and I ended up going to the army, but I think in general, can you talk a little bit about just like that first kind of jump into the corporate world? So from being a college and pro athlete, um, you know, where did you go from there and how did you kind of navigate that, that process? For sure. Um, I think anyone on the call or in general who was a college athlete or pro athlete, whatever it may be, it is really, really, really hard to transition out of that. And I don't think there's a recipe, at least I didn't have one for how to handle it and deal with it and figure out, okay, you lose your identity for your whole life. And then you're going to sit in a desk and, and work at the bottom of the totem pole. Right. So it was very, very hard. Um, but at the same time, I think that like the whole point of sports, I think is the community and the team you're around. So for me, even though some days I was like, what the heck am I doing with my life? Um, you reach out to the people that you you know, we're on teams with or who, you know, we're older, who look like they've achieved something outside of sports. And you say like, Hey, how the heck do you do this? Um, and you ask honest questions and try to take advice. Um, but I would say the first, like I'm five years out of college now. So, um, the first two and a half or three years were really confusing. Um, and I just had to like grind and take the time and try a couple different jobs to see what actually fulfills me enough where I can put my head on the pillow at night and be like, okay, that day felt good. Um, while at the same time trying to continue exercising and exerting my body. Cause that's all I did for 22 years. So. Yeah, for sure. And I think it's like, it is super difficult and definitely resonates with me just throughout the number of kind of career transitions I've made. Um, so when you think about kind of how you made that jump from finance to really looking into business intelligence, but then on top of that, business intelligence and sports, can you kind of talk about that as you navigated your time and figuring out what you want to do? Sure. So um, growing up and even maybe a little too later in life, I was like, you know what, I'm going to play for the Chicago Blackhawks. That was like my dream as a, as a kid. Um, obviously, I realized that is that is not possible, but um, that always stuck in my head of working for an NHL team at some point. Um, but when I went to college and a lot of my Princeton classmates went straight to Wall Street and I kind of assumed that that's the right path because you can make a lot of money and you use your brain and and why not do that? Um, so I did that. Um, and I think ultimately after a while, especially when COVID hit, you kind of really reflect and think to yourself, okay, what am I doing? Is this what I want? Um, and for me, of course, everyone wants to make money that, that I guess that's the point of a job, but in the end, um, like that wasn't enough, especially I think when COVID hits and you're at your apartment, you know, literally waking up unclear on what the purpose of the day is. Um, so that was kind of the general feeling I got of like, okay, like it's been a couple of years now, this is not I am using my brain, but I'm not doing things. I don't, I don't think basically what I thought to myself is like, I want to see my boss, my boss's boss. And I want to be them. Right. I think that's like a good sign that you're in a career that is good for you. And I didn't have that yet. So I'm like, hopefully I'm not someone who's just going to search and search, but I got to keep searching. Um, so then for the crack in, um, in general, the NHL, I knew I wanted to work in hockey and I know that it's very hard to break into sports. Um, so I did what I think a lot of people do. And I kind of looked on LinkedIn and saw, so this is two and a half years ago. Yeah. I saw that the Kraken had just formed, you know, they're two years away from their first season. And I found Kendall Tyson. She's my boss's boss now on LinkedIn. And I saw she played hockey at um, club hockey at Yale. And she was the vice president of the business intelligence team at the Kraken. So I was like, I don't really know what that means, but she seems awesome. And she's a powerful female leader, which is also pretty rare. So I just cold messaged her on LinkedIn. 
um, kind of somewhat stalked her for the next year and a half and just reached out, you know, every six months to do a follow-up call. How are you guys doing? Have you guys hired your team, et cetera? And she was gracious enough to be a mentor. And then full circle, um, she would, she, they put out posts for hiring for their team. Um, and I applied and I had none of the, none of the tech qualifications at all, um, which I'm sure will be a question, but that's how I found the Kraken. And I knew I wanted to be in data and using my brain a lot in the sport that I love, um, which is ultimately why I stalked her on LinkedIn. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And I, I've done the same with Kendall. So I'm sure she's tired of everyone that reaches out to her, but she's been an awesome person for me to keep in touch with. Um, as I was kind of navigating, leaving an MBA and trying to work in sports, she had also done her MBA. Um, and so it was really cool to kind of stay in touch with her. So obviously we have that in uh, common. Um, let's talk a little bit about like culture too. Like you kind of came from more of an established corporate culture to mm -hmm. a brand new NHL franchise culture. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, when, when you think about like roles that in the NHL, when you were looking at different teams, obviously you knew Kendall, but like, what were some of the things you were looking for? And then what did you see as the opportunity with a brand new team and what you could build there as you know someone working in this space? Yep, for sure. So first of all, I think when I was starting the search, obviously I did look at kind of LinkedIn and, and formed a bond with her, but I think I knew that getting into the sports world and NHL world, you, you can't be too picky, right? Because like once you get a start, that's that's what you need. Um, but ultimately what exciting about Kraken is um, a lot of what I had heard and was learning about them is they wanted to be super, super innovative, um, which excited me because I think that coming from the private equity world where I was in before, it's very old school and very rigid and there's nothing wrong with it. I learned so much and met a lot of amazing people, but it's a hierarchical structure that, you know, okay, you're going to build this model today. Then tomorrow you're going to do this. Then hopefully in two years, you're this. And which is stability and great. And like I said, you can live a very, a good life, but I was looking to kind of break out of that because the skill set I have is more, Hey, here's this blank sheet of a big project. Can you go run with it and ask us for help when you need it? which you're, I was not getting in the private equity world at all. Um, so that's kind of what I really, what drew me to the Kraken and the thought of something brand new that did not exist before made me think, okay, if I could get in there somehow and grind and work super hard, I would hope the ceiling, the ceiling could be super high. Um, so that's kind of why I honed in on that, I would say. Yeah, for sure. I, I could totally see that. Um, so when we talk about like the culture, you were kind of talking about, not that I'll ask you what your skills are, but can you talk a little bit about, I think a lot of people, you know, for instance, with me, I am self-taught on Tableau, SQL, Python, R, et cetera, and I still kind of struggle through each one. Um, can you talk about kind of that journey of learning and understanding what you needed, like what skills you needed as you started the role and how you needed to close your knowledge gap in the industry? Um, specifically with technical skills, but also just kind of some of the, the qualitative knowledge that, that might come, with, come in with, you know, hey, I need to build this for an NHL team versus, you know, a, a different organization. Totally. Um, I love that question because it's, I have very honest answers. So when I applied for the Kraken and looked at the job description, I saw, you know, proficient in Tableau, proficient in SQL, and I had never heard of Tableau. And SQL, I thought, I said, I thought it was pronounced SQL, right? So I was like, okay, I know nothing. Um, and I applied anyways, and I was honest in the interview process, but they had, we had to do a project like for the final round. And I was like, oh boy, here we go. Um, and I spent basically like two days and nights all night long on YouTube and Googling Tableau and Googling like how to create box, like all these things and to create this project. And I was like, I hope I'm not that behind, but at least they'll know I want to learn. Um, so somehow it worked out, but basically when I started the job on day one, um, I was like, or in previous when I had a couple weeks off, but I was like, there's resources out there that are way smarter than me. And that is very clear. And so I think that a lot of times with Tableau, SQL, tech stack in general, like you have to be an expert Googler and there's nothing wrong with that. Like, I think some of the best software engineers at Google themselves, Google things all day to try to figure it out. So I started there and would just like tab all the resources that were helpful to me. And obviously with Tableau, um, the Tableau public page, I 
got so many ideas from that. Um, and then the forums, I'm definitely an avid forum poster. I'm sure the Tableau ambassadors or whatever are like, oh God, here's Fiona again with another question. Um, but it's helpful. I'm like, why would I spin my wheels for 10 hours if someone could help me out and then I could help someone else out? Um, so those were like the nitty gritty of what I used a lot. Um, and I think still to this day, every project I do, I spend half the time figuring out you know, what Tableau logic is correct before I even open the Tableau project, so. Yeah, and I mean, like, I think one of the key things that I, I want to highlight with you is like, as a person coming in is you were basically starting from scratch. Like they probably had some ideas as an organization and maybe some like draft things they were doing. You know, they had selected Tableau as the tool that they were going to use, but like maybe talk about kind of like the, the process that you take when you're thinking about, okay, here's the business problem. And we're going to see some of those here in a little bit, but like, here's the business problem. How do you kind of go from business problem to, you know, solving for that, that problem that, that people have, whether it's ticketing partnerships, et cetera, mm -hmm. in the organization? Yeah, totally. So I think that question reminds me of the first project that I was given after like being onboarded for a month was oh, we need this we need a ticketing dashboard. And I got a lot of advice and, and thoughts, but people were running around like chickens with their head cut off because the season was going to start our schedules posted. Like we got a lot to do. Like you gotta, you gotta try to own this. Right. Which is, I think an amazing culture to be in. Um, but basically long story short there is I, I had my finance head on and I basically created like a, a dashboard, but it was so visually not appealing, very boring and, and literally black and white. And it had numbers, but I didn't touch any of the formatting. I just like had the information almost in an Excel spreadsheet format. And I showed my boss that and they were like, okay, so that's great. The numbers are there, but like, there's a lot of other layers here that we need you to explore. Cause no one else has like, this is your job. You gotta, you got, we, we need it to be like dynamic and a lot better. And that kind of hit me. And I was like, oh, like this is the environment that I want to be in, number one, because they're trusting me to do this. Number two, this isn't Excel, right? This is this is a crazy powerful tool that we need to make it better than anyone's ever seen because it didn't exist before. The report at the crack, and I'm saying. Um, so for me now, I have like a list of, anytime I receive a project or a request, I have like a list of business questions. I'll always ask them like, okay, what questions do you want answered from this data, right? Because most of the time the people who are asking me are on different departments who don't even know what Tableau is. They just want something sweet in their inbox to help them answer the question, right? So I'll ask them, what questions do they have? Write those down and make sure that no matter what I do, those questions are easily answered and they can look at it, think it looks really cool and find the answer immediately. Um, another thing is I think that it's always helpful to like get a frame first before you spend hours digging into Tableau and show them, hey, is this, is this appealing to you? Is this what you were thinking about? Just the way you want it to look. Um, because ultimately like what I think helps me is like, I, I know that my job is to make other people's jobs easier and more efficient. Um, so I may like some sweet dynamic filter. Well, they may not even use it. So then why would we even do that? Right. So getting into that mindset of like, I am telling them I'm here for you. What questions do you want answered? Does this look good to you? And then doing it all for them, um, is kind of my approach every time. Yeah, for sure. And I think that's something, you know, for anyone starting out or in general, like I think across strategy and analytics really beyond Tableau, but a big highlight is making sure that like, you know, it's, you can build all the models or dashboards in the world, but if people aren't going to look at them or understand them, then like, what's the point? And so I think it's really understanding and sitting with those users and people that are actually going to be like reading the reports or understanding what needs to be done or actually being able to execute from what you're giving them, it'll make your work so much more valuable than just kind of creating a dashboard that looks really cool, but doesn't really answer any of their questions. Um, so I think you've laid that process out really well on some of the best practices as far as kind of, you know, and it's, it's hard sometimes when you're building things from scratch because they don't know what they want. You don't really know what they want and you're trying to kind of push back and forth. And so that's why that constant set of communication is like super important. Mm -hmm. um, so like kind of shifting, you know, across, like you talked a little about your journey to the Kraken. I think like just talking day to day, what are some of the things that, you know, day to day that you're required to do there as the business intelligence analyst? Um, and what are some of the ways that you think you've really expanded on the role since you started last summer? 
Yeah, for sure. Um, so when I first came in, um, I was Tableau heavy the whole time, probably my first six months. Um, and I'm almost at a year now. So the first half of the year was Tableau, Tableau, Tableau. We just need to get, you know, which you'll see later on in the presentation, but these three main dashboards out the door and working and automated because this is what our executive executive team needs. So the goal was by, you know, Jan one, halfway through our first season, these need to be pumped out and, and exactly where we want them to be. So that was like my whole world. And then lately, actually a lot of, um, so the second half of the year, um, I still do a lot of Tableau, but, um, it's a lot more, I'm doing a bit more of the data engineering side for right now, which is, is, you know, a little separate from this call, but, um, it's all connected. Right. So I think a lot of times with Tableau, um, you know, the, the, the person creating the report is only as good as the data is. And the data is only as good as the people on the team that are, structuring the data right so it's all so connected um and i actually like the mixture because i think something that i've learned recently is tableau logic and calculated fields are so powerful but if you can make those simpler by making the data engineering side cleaner then someone can open up your report like open up your like you know let's say a coordinator comes in or an intern or whoever and opens up your report to work on it and they can actually understand the business logic that you use in tableau or right now, honestly, some of the reports we created in the beginning of the season, there's so much different, so many different logic and filters and, and duplicated measures that it'd be really hard for someone to come in and just open it and, and improve it or take it over or, or replicate. Um, so that's kind of, I think, how my role has shifted, which I couldn't have predicted, but it's really, really, I think, important because um, we're just going to grow, right? This data sports is just going to continue to grow, especially in the NHL and you want it to be more efficient. If, if we're expected to make reports efficient for other people in our organization, our team has to be efficient as well, so. Yeah, for sure. And I think for anyone kind of like newer to sports and any industry, but like the number of disparate data sources that you have coming in. So before you even get to Tableau, you have primary ticketing, secondary ticketing, partnerships data, uh, arena data, concessions, food and uh, like, concessions plus like retail, all these sorts of different data sources. So a lot of teams have to grapple with a number of sources coming in with usually a smaller staff than what you would find in, in other um, industries. And so I think Fiona really brings up a good point here is you can't really plug everything in together because how the secondary ticketing report comes in, the primary ticketing report comes in, like the seats might not match. Like we were talking about that a little bit before the call, um, but like, the naming on the seats might be one word off or something like that. So there's all this logic that comes in to kind of tie those things together. Um, and it can take a ton of time and you end up having people spending so much time on that that you can't do as much on, on the other side. Mm -hmm. um, and then kind of like going into like you just as a, as a general employee, like how have you taken advantage of, you know, Tableau, Seattle-based kind of organization has been there for a very long time. Um, so a lot of, I think, Seattleites on the call today, um, we pushed it a lot in the, in the internal channels here. Um, how have you kind of, as an employee there, really taken advantage of being in, in that city of Seattle where you have all these tech companies and people doing really innovative things from tech staff perspective or just in general, like lessons learned from different kind of perspectives there? Yeah, for sure. Um, so having lived in Chicago before this for the past couple of years, very, very different type of city. Um, and I did not know what to expect besides I knew I think I would like skiing. Um, so I came out here and I think in all seriousness, I'm sure Seattle people in the chat would, would laugh at this. Um, like there are times when I'm at bars or wherever, or breweries or skiing or whatever. And I'm like on a chair lift and I'll, so I'm like, Oh, like, what do you do? Nice Kraken hoodie, whatever. And I'll say, Oh, you know, I, I work in business intelligence for Kraken. Like, Oh, very cool. Like, so what do you do? Like Tableau? I'm like, Yes, actually. Um, so it's funny because I don't think you're going to get that in a lot of other cities. And I say that funny story just because um, that is unique. Um, and then you can like, like crack jokes about, you know, oh, you can't copy and paste Tableau and we're laughing and then we get off the chairlift. Like that is not normal. Um, and I love it. Um, but in all seriousness, I think that's, it's very helpful outside of the Kraken to talk to people, especially who work at these super mega established tech companies um, who are doing the same things as I'm doing just with a way bigger team and way more processes and et cetera, cause it's just massive, right? So I can talk to get coffee with someone who works at Amazon or Google or Microsoft and be like, hey, I'm learning SQL for the first time. Um, do you, what, what kind of resources did you use? And they have 
so many either at their companies or what they did prior, especially as someone who does not have a computer science background, does not have a statistics background. I major in history. I should have said that in my background, but um, um, which is I, I use it to read books at night, um, but that's about it, which is that's OK, too. But then my point here is that it's really nice to hear from people and learn from people who this was their whole world since they you know got to college. And I think at the crack and in general, um, there's a buzz in the city, as you would expect from any new franchise. People people are excited as fans, as you know, people as tech people, and they want to know what we're doing and how we're doing it. And they're really willing to help. Um, which I didn't expect that necessarily either. I thought people would be like in their own silos, but the people are curious about what we're doing and how we're doing it. Um, and as a young employee at, you know, at more of the bottom level, I, I can reap the benefits of it as long as I put myself out there. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think like my last question before we kind of switch to you, giving a quick overview of some of the dashboards you wanted to show today is, you know, you came in last summer, uh, Kindle's obviously been with the Kraken for a bit, but can you talk a little bit about just like scaling the use of data and Tableau across more users at the Kraken? Um, I know that at a lot of organizations, you have like analysts working on the dashboards and then, you know, it's sometimes like sending bullet points or the insights. But can you talk a little bit about how that culture has continued to grow at the, at the organization and what are some of the things that you've kind of heard recently or, or things like that that can help, that have showed that people are more interested in actually getting in the tool and getting to, to use the filters and things like that? For sure. Um, I love that question too, because the amount of times in the beginning of the my first couple months where people would walk by our desk and be like, so what does the BI team do? I'm like, oh boy, right? Like you have to show people what you create or else they, they, they don't know what BI is or, or data analytics for that matter. So um, the point there is that uh, Kendall and, and our head of our team um, made a point right from the start, like we want to use Tableau. We want to stray away from just pulling Excel reports for our CEO, et cetera, just because it's quicker in the beginning. Um, we want to use Tableau and really push that. And I would say it probably took like, you know, three to six months to get to, to have that word be not just a buzzword, but a normalized word in our office. And then as well as um, where people actually requested Tableau reports instead of just saying, hey, can you pull some numbers, right? So, and recently too, I think is that, I think it, it takes a bit, right? Originally we just did, you know, automated PDF emails all the time, which was really helpful and still looked better than receiving an Excel spreadsheet necessarily. But um, recently, now that the season has kind of unfolded a little bit, it, it was been showing certain people higher up what it looks like when you actually go into Tableau, Tableau online more so, and, and see what it's like to interact with the dashboards and be able to press, you know, a filter and filter by X, Y, Z, or press a button that takes you to the next sheet without, you know, automatically, um, which you cannot do with PDFs or images. So that's been a process, right? You have to educate, but also show, and the keyword is show, where in sports you're so busy, it might take a while to get someone you know, to fully focus on this different product they've never seen before. Once they see it, you know, the always reaction is like, whoa, this is so awesome. Like, can you do this, this, and this? We're like, okay, that takes about 27 business hours, but we'll get back to you on that. But yeah, so it's showing, showing, showing. And recently um, we've had a, the past couple months, a lot of success with that um, as we built up just the words and the usage and, and now hopefully usage from others outside of our team. Yeah. And I, I think like a lot of times people get so scared by just the word data. It like, scares them they're like oh I just need the report like I don't need to see all the data and like that's the whole point of Tableau but like the fact is you can you know for like an arena map or a stadium map actually zoom into the seat and see what's happening with each seat you know whether it be average revenue per user or per attendee or things like that and so it really allows like someone in you know season ticket services or partnerships to understand like where are the heaviest spenders they might not be the ones maybe from a ticketing standpoint, they're the ones you know, spending the most on, on tickets, but they might not be the ones that are spending the most when they come to the arena and are buying you know, $100 worth of stuff at the concession stands and $300 worth of stuff at the, you know, the retail um, store. So I think that's kind of where it's like that power when people get the light bulb that comes on, like, oh, I can actually dig into this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, cool, well, I'm gonna share my screen back again to have Fiona kind of go through a couple business use cases that she has, as well as the dashboards that support them. And then 
we'll, we'll kick it right off to questions from there. So uh, feel free to drop your questions as we're kind of going through this in the chat. I actually see some. Um, yeah, so feel free to either throw them in the chat or uh, on the actual Q&A kind of tab and we'll go from there. Nice slide, good logo. It's one of my favorite uh, logos in sports. Branding. Right. <laughs> um, okay, sweet. So this is the post game report. Obviously, all these numbers are dubbed out or fake. So the seventeen three five eight is our capacity. That's public knowledge. Um, but besides that, these numbers are not real. Um, that'd be sweet if we had a hundred dollar per cap. But anyways, um, so this is the post event report. Um, that was kind of like part of the first six months of, of my role of getting this off the ground and, and iterating better versions each time. Um, so yeah, so after every home game, this was sent out at 7 a.m. Um, to a bunch of our, our executive team and, and heads of certain departments. Um, and the point of this, as in the bullet point is, you know, a bird's eye view for, for the executives. They, you know, probably get a zillion emails after they go to every game, most likely. So they're going to wake up and want to see, boom, of our three main revenue sources for a game. How did we do last night, especially compared to games thus far? Um, especially being a new team, we don't have, you know, previous data to go off of to check how we're doing. So the running averages throughout the season is all, is the only historical thing we have. Um, so it's really important to see over the course of the season, averages wise, I'm sure next year it'll be really interesting to compare to this year. But um, yeah, so this is the three main revenue sources. And as Catherine said earlier, um, there's multiple data sources that are pulling into this report, which which in itself was, was a whole, a whole um, ordeal to make sure it was clean and correct. Um, and yeah, this is, that's the post of our report. Um, the next one is the ticking report. This one, <laughs> I have a little bit of PTSD, but um, this is our ticking report for the primary market only. Um, this is sent out or was sent out, not the season's over for us, but um, every day at 6 a.m. to our ticketing team and other executives. And, you know, it's blurred out obviously, but it shows for club general admission and our total our totals in terms of sold revenue, what's still available, what's being held, what's comped, and we can see where we're at game by game. Um, the little, the filter dynamic, dynamic logos on the left probably took me way too long, but um, there's, I, I, I posted on some forums there, et cetera, especially when games were rescheduled due to COVID. Oh boy. The, the, the emails I got saying, wait, why is it say we're playing? I'm like, oh crap. Um, so just funny there, but I'm sure people experience that. Um, but yeah, so what I said earlier for the business questions is, um, you know, this was basically the questions we were having. What was sold yesterday? What's been sold to date? And how much do we have left to sell, right? Our ticking team is on the phones. They're working as hard as they possibly can. They need quick information daily to inform how they're going to go throughout their day and, and make the crack more money. Um, so this is what we came up with. And the bottom was a summary sheet that I think most of our executives use more to just track overall, how are we doing and how can we change that today? Um, Cause I keep saying daily, just because I think that's, it's so much easier to do this daily. Like it runs automatically now aside that aside from pulling spreadsheets and totaling, it leaves so much for human error, which we don't have when you use Tableau. So yeah, I'm going to pause you there. Can you talk a little bit about kind of some of the challenges you face with, um, I know around December, January, a lot of the games were getting canceled or rescheduled. Mm -hmm. You just talk about like navigating that and, you know, like you said, trying to like answer questions for people on certain games, but then having to figure out how to like resolve the issues on the Tableau reports that you want everybody to trust, you know, um, yeah. can you talk a little bit about that. Totally. So I think, um, I think what was hard is that for example, I think uh, I'm trying to look the, the, I think the, I can't see it actually it's so tiny, but um, whatever game was, was rescheduled in January, right? There was a couple um, immediately that next day, like this report was sent out and unfortunately, right. Those games were blurred out and the logo was wrong and it wasn't correct. Right. So we were like, oh shoot, like we got to fix on the back end. And what stinks about this, I think I'm sure a lot of people would understand this is that's not a tableau problem. That's, that's a, data engineering problem or to fix. We're going to go back in on the way back end and, and change the scripts we had for the schedule and everything like that, where it'd be so much easier. I remember thinking to myself, I wish I could just open the Tableau report, delete this row and just put it as a static image and call it a day, right? And then you can send it, reset it out 20 minutes later. But once you do that and make Tableau 
manual, you can't go back, right? And you just stack on this manual list of things that you did, which defeats the whole purpose and the efficiency of, of the product, I think at least. Um, so we did, we had to spend a couple of days like going in the back end on the engineering side and making sure we're, we're, we're crossing all our T's and, and anywhere where those gains were used in, in scripts that exist in, in our warehouse, we had to make sure it was correct. Um, so that was like a process instead of just copying and pasting an image. Um, that took a little bit to make sure we honed in on. Um, and I also think we learned a lot from that process for next season and future seasons. Hopefully, you know, nothing, COVID doesn't happen again or something like that. But in hindsight, it's always 2020. We now know like, oh, we should maybe simplify, simplify our scripts or simplify this or this so that reschedules are easier to, to handle on the data side. Yeah, and I think that's like, like you said, I mean, it's, it's like a massive pipeline of data that's coming in from your ticketing partner and everything else where the dates are all different and it's a mess. Um, and so again, short staff trying to figure this out, but also answer the business questions and build report for a report that you want people to read and rely on. Um, right. It's definitely like a, a tough line a lot of times. Um, cool, and we'll go to the third one. Yep, so this is a secondary market report, which uh, I'm sure a lot of you on this call, et cetera, secondary market is a beast of its own breed, um, but this is similar. So it was sent. So the, the last one and this one are sent daily at 6 a.m. together. Um, and, you know, our, the secondary market report, um, I think is more, it, it's harder in the sense that it's harder to get, I think the right business questions answered because it's just a complicated thing, but we wanted to, to know the same things. What was resold yesterday? What's been resold to date? Um, and the last question I think was the most important, how does it impact our primary market strategy today and moving forward? Um, especially as a new team, new organization, um, you, you, you don't know your season ticket holders trends until the season's happening, right? We, you don't know the market in Seattle until it occurred. Um, so seeing this daily and being able for people to hone in on a game quickly and inform that strategy for that day, I think was really important, um, especially being brand new. Um, yeah, the, the blue colors and stuff, I had fun with that. Um, yeah, those are our three main reports that I spent kind of the first half of the year uh, finalizing. Yeah, and I think the use of color to like highlight certain things, especially if you're still relying on PDFs so people can actually see and make it pop yeah. and understand. And I know we talk about that a lot at Tableau, um, just effective design and things like that. Um, so yeah, we, you kind of talked about this a little bit, um, just jumping into questions. Let me stop sharing. Sorry, I'm a lot of multitasking by me today. Um, okay. Um, so one of the first questions we got was just like, you've already kind of talked about, um, your role and what it means, or you've talked a little bit about your role, but can you talk a little bit about like what it means for a professional sports franchise? Like, do you talk to a lot of your peers in the industry and things like that, that might, um, help you kind of grow? I know you talked a little about relying on the tech community, but any mm -hmm. other kind of feedback you have there, just like what it means to work in a professional sports franchise, who you talk to and things like that. For sure. Yeah. I think um, when I get asked this question by friends or people who are in the sports world, but not in the data world, um, I, I think what, like, what I realized is once I joined the Kraken as a BI analyst, like in the NHL, there's at most 30, 32 of us, right? So that's a really small community. Um, and so like, whether it's conferences or through this, I've, I've shared with a bunch of people sometimes on the regular, um, just about like, We'll literally share a screen and be like, oh my gosh, I cannot figure this out. Like, do you know how to do this on Tableau? Um, so it's like once you're once you're in this world and you meet, you know, a handful of other people doing your role, it's so important to keep those connections because there's not many people doing this. And our data and sports data is so different than the corporate world. And there's so many more, I at least in my opinion, um, moving pieces on on the regular that it's really important to connect with the people who are in your world. And I think um I don't know. I think the, the business intelligence, at least in the NHL, um, is somewhat newer. Um, and a lot of teams are growing to provide it now and to, and to grow it now. And, and I think that's a special time for people to get in and to connect because 
we, I think we are kind of at, at a baseline as a league overall, and we're just going to continue using data to power every decision, both on the business side and the hockey side. So it's a fun time to be in it. And I think the connections are ever more important for that reason. Yeah, for sure. And I think like for the NHL and, you know, the NBA, um, obviously baseball, MLB, there's sometimes seven or eight games in a row every night. It's mm -hmm. sometimes hard to make adjustments. I think with the NBA and NHL, there's a lot of games, but then there might be an expectation to make adjustments between games because, you know, there's maybe two or three a week. Um, and so I think that challenge as well can come in. Um, the question about, you know, data about waiting times in the arena um, to determine the fan experience. Can you just talk about like the fan experience as a whole and kind of that holistic idea and why you're looking at all these data sources? Mm -hmm. um, and just, you know, obviously with the newish kind of, really new but renovated arena in in Seattle like what that looks like for you all and, and the ability to kind of see a lot more things than maybe people in more um you know old older arenas for sure yeah so waiting time specifically um <laughs> we have a lot of Amazon just walk out is our is our main um vendor I don't know if that's the right word but that's what we use in the arena a lot so the goal is that there's no waiting times obviously that changes a lot in between periods and people ultimately you can't fit thousands of people in an in a Amazon just walk out cafe, but um, that helps a lot. But in general, um, our goal is, I'm sure this is a buzzword for a lot of people is to have like a 360 degree customer view of, okay, you bought a ticket to the game. First of all, how'd you buy it? You bought the ticket. Did you show up? Did your ticket actually scan in and was it you? And then from there, what was your experience starting the second you walked in? What entryway did you walk in? What time did you walk in? Did you receive that giveaway, right? Um, and then from there, what did you purchase? How much did you purchase? Um, how far was that from your seat? Um, retail wise, did you purchase anything from the retail shop? Which, which vendor, which store did you purchase it from in the arena? Um, all of those things, our goal is to have, you know, 360 degree view of, of our fan base. Um, obviously we're not there yet. That is, that is massive and that's the goal but we're at we're starting there and we're trying to get honed in on different pieces and right now that's why the ticketing food and beverage and retail is is the main part of our post event dashboard because that is the most revenue to start with and we can kind of learn from our fans there but there's a lot more to it um and we're hoping i think it i think it is really important to see in general what time in seattle specifically are fans actually coming to the game at doesn't matter if it's a weekday or a weekend doesn't matter who the opponent is and from there those details I think can really help other departments and organization from a marketing perspective, from, you know, social media, et cetera. So that was kind of a roundabout answer, but that is the goal. Um, the fan experience is the utmost importance for us. And I, I can't wait to see how we progress as an organization to learn from our fans and everything they do. Yeah. And I think <clears throat> like you've talked about a few times, just like your first year, it's like a lot of times, like almost throwing spaghetti on the wall and saying like, we hope this is what they want. Mm -hmm. And then it's kind of figuring out, making adjustments from there, pulling back on certain things, increasing other things. Yep. Um, Chris wants to like really bring you back to some tough times. Um, he kind of asked, like you talked a little bit about, you know, the expectation of uh, the report being sent at 6 a.m. and then, you know, some, some pipeline not working and kind of how did you have to kind of make adjustments or, you know, talk to people and say, hey, it's coming, you know, things like that. Yes, 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 yes. That's a fun question. There's obviously this data is not perfect. So um, the worst thing I, I think and our team tries to focus on is we never wanted to send like a blank report or nothing is worse than having null in it, right? Because then the people who get the report are like, what the heck is a null? And this is not helpful, right? And it, if we're trying to grow BI and data, <laughs> that does not help our case, right? So and you know the Kraken is fully on board, and that's not what I mean by any by any means. But they've never seen this stuff before. So um, to answer your question, um, I would do at least for the first half of the season, I would I would do a lot of tests just with SQL and stuff to see kind of that the data is flowing in correctly and and check our DAGs and whatnot. But um, a lot of times for the first half of the season, the six a.m. I would just send to myself and like my boss, and then you know, wake up super early and, and make sure that, that it looked good and it was correct and then resubscribe it right away. So they got it like 603. Um, and the times when there were problems, um, we ended up, you know, some data sources, unfortunately, unfortunately, like it's not, it's completely out of our control and it just, 
is a delay on their end. And they're such a massive company and, or their parent company is massive that it's, we are not going to be a priority to fix it so that, you know, at 604, it's correct. So um, I would just have like a, an email ready to go on my drafts, every home game that said due to, you know, vendor or whatever issue it might be, here was the actual gross rev or, or per cap. Um, not ideal. Um, hopefully in the future we can figure that out, but I think it's like a longstanding problem that a lot of organizations face that over time, I think will be fixed, but no, it sucked. And there were many times where I was like, you've got to be kidding me setting my alarm at like 6am on a Saturday, but it is what it is. Yeah, no. And I think that's a great point of having that backup plan. Like, you know, it can be painful, but you have that backup plan. It was ready to go. So it's less painful in some ways, um, exactly. yeah. you know, and, and if you can build that kind of rapport with, with the leaders of the organization that, um, you know, whatever Chris says, he does it at 6 a.m. or 8 a.m. Um, so maybe you can push it back a little bit, but it gets a little higher early risers. <laughs> I that's a little higher in the command chain for me, but yeah, I mean, also realistically, are they opening at 6 a.m.? I'm not, I'm not sure. So we'll see. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, cool. Any other questions? Uh, just as we go, I know we're kind of hitting on, on time. Um, give it a couple seconds here. Oh, wait, you may have one. Okay. Uh, no, we already answered that one. Gives me like a little. Cool. Well, um, let me just. So feel free to ask any questions over LinkedIn. Um, also send the link to our actual Tableau user group community page. Make sure you're subscribed for updates because it'll send you reminders when we have new events. And then we obviously push it on the LinkedIn page just so we have it. Um, Oh, we've got a question about uh, Tableau to analyze in-game strategy. Um, you're kind of on the business side, right? Yeah, I'm fully Always. business side. Yeah, so some teams do use Tableau on the on the sports side, especially with like the increase in player tracking data. Um, a lot of it comes down to like coaching staff preferences and what type type of analysts they have on staff. Some teams use, you know, pure R with reports on PDFs. Some teams use Tableau um, with player tracking data. It's pretty big file. So it can be a little difficult um, to manage. And I feel like that's another area. And, and Fiona talked about this a lot, like just the increase in these tools and the staff size, and you can see it in a lot of sports have continued to increase, um, continue to get more sophisticated as more investments placed in the, in the spaces that we'll probably see more and more Tableau use or advanced modeling and, and different things um, there. Um, so, Thank you, Fiona, so much for, for joining. Um, you know, it's a little early your time. For me, it was a great time. <laughs> um, any visits that you all get inspired to do around, around the tug, feel free to, to share it on Tableau Public with the sports tug hashtag. Um, like I said, the next, the next one will be kind of June, July. We'll, we'll be in touch with the timing um, pending the Warriors uh, NBA playoffs time, but super excited to have Kim, um, from the Warriors join us. Um, our emails are right here. Feel free to reach out to get involved with the, with the, um, tug for sure. Um, LinkedIn page, I'm going to drop both links right now. Um, so this is the user group subscription page in the chat. Um, let me grab the Tableau user group page request to join there. Like I said, I, I tend to, to share any jobs that have Tableau included in the description or visualization or analytics. Um, feel free to connect with, with Fiona, like she said here in the chat. Um, super awesome presentation. And like I said at the beginning, if you weren't here, please, please, please reach out if you have any ideas you want to present or anything else, um, you know, so on and so forth. So uh, Chris said one particular team might have an opening. So um, I'm assuming it's, it's the Canes and, and if you're interested, talk to Chris, um, feel free to load up his LinkedIn. Um, but yeah, thank you guys so much for coming. Um, Fiona again, thank you. And again, like the, the group is only as strong as the membership that comes to these events that asks for topics that wants to present. So super open to anyone, anyone coming and joining. Cool. Well, from there. Thank you all so much, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye, everybody.